Call this meeting to order and welcome you to this, the first meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2020 and can I wish everyone a happy and peaceful 2020. The first item on our agenda today is the consideration of new petitions. The first new petition for consideration today is Petition 1767 on Scottish Fire and Rescue Legislation and Human Rights, lodged by Stuart Munro. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to conduct a review of the Fire Scotland Act 2005 and the Fire Additional Function Scotland Order 2005 to ensure full compliance with Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Human Rights Act 1998 and the Scotland Act 1998. The petitioner is concerned that legislation pertaining to the principal functions of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is not compliant with Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Right to Life. With regard to firefighting, the 2005 Act provides that the SFRS must make provision to extinguish fires and protect life and property in the event of fires. With regard to road traffic emergencies, the 2005 Act sets out that the SFRS must make provision for the purpose of rescuing persons in the event of road traffic accidents and to the extent that it considers it reasonable to do so, protect persons from serious harm in the event of road traffic accidents in its area. The petitioner has provided a written submission which challenges this supposition in the SPICE briefing that, quote, SFRS's principal function to protect life and property in the event of fires would include the rescue of individuals from fires, but only on the basis that to effect such a rescue would not endanger the lives of others or firefighters themselves. The petitioner contends that it is practically impossible to carry out the successful rescue of victims from a fire without exposing firefighters to some degree of risk. And where the SFRS operating to this criterion, the, the vast majority of rescues would not have taken place. Uh, I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Come to me. Hospital pass. Um, I, I, I'm struggling with this, to be quite honest. I don't understand how or, what, exactly what the petitioner is asking for here. Um, I mean, is, is, is the petitioner suggesting that firefighters should... should Try and rescue somebody from a fire, no matter what. Um, surely, it must. There must be a judgment call. That's that, that, that's that's what they're trained to do. There must be a judgment call in in uh, uh, in circumstances where uh, the, the likelihood is that in effecting some sort of rescue that others put, put others in danger of, of losing their life. And, that, and for me, that must remain a judgment call for for those in, in those positions. I don't quite understand what the petitioner is asking for here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, that uh, I mean, certainly firefighters put themselves in situations where they have to rescue other people and, you know, everything is relevant on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, they are trained to the highest degree. I think it would be interesting to write to probably Scottish Government to, to ask about this um contravention almost about you know the the human rights act and and you know because i i can't imagine that it does contravene the act but just to get that in in writing would be helpful okay anyone else i think i think, I mean, I think it's a, as you say it's a judgment call at the time i mean the, the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service are a professional body of people. They're trained to the highest degree. Um, obviously, they, 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 their aim is to save life, um, but equally, they've got to make judgment calls at the time. And, and, it, and I agree with Brian and, and Gail. It's just, it, it, it is there. Um, and I cannot believe they don't put that into full operation every time an incident happens. I think there's one thing I recollect from the briefing, I'm not sure where, where it was, is that there was a a commitment to review the Act, um, and I don't think that's happened. So it might be worthwhile asking the Scottish Government are they intending to do that, and, and that in itself may offer some kind of um, sort of resolution for the, the petitioner to feel that actually this matter has been looked at. What's the balance between um, the role in terms of firefighting and the safety of all those those involved? And that's obviously something that everybody's um, concerned about. So I think one of the things I suppose that we want to Almost, my sense is the petition. What we would be looking for is some reassurance that the logical and rational things that we would expect firefighters to be doing 
are being done um, with the best consideration of safety for all involved. Um, and that very specifically asking this question around the review of the Act, mm -hmm. which may in itself be something that would give reassurance. Is that agreed? agreed. Okay. In that case, we're agreeing to write the Scottish Government and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service seeking their views on the action called for in the petition. And we thank the petitioner for lodging the petition. The second new petition for consideration today is Petition 1770 on Improving Water Safety, lodged by Margaret Spears. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to work with all relevant bodies across Scotland to improve water safety by ensuring that all waterways have life-saving equipment, such as life belts and buoyancy throw bags with ropes to allow multiple attempts at rescue, and tampering with water safety equipment is made a criminal offence of endangering public safety. The petition was due to give oral evidence today that this has not been possible due to circumstances beyond her control. The petitioner has been able to provide a written submission ahead of her consideration, which is included in our meeting papers. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, yes, Gail. I mean, this is a, a really emotive and, and, and tragic circumstance. Um, and I think that it's completely logical that there should be life-saving equipment beside all our waterways in Scotland. I, I, I really can't see an argument against that. Um, I think that there has been, from, from our papers, there has been real progress in Glasgow um, towards uh, what the petitioner is asking for. Um, and I think that we, sh we definitely should be following this up with Scottish Government and any other um, appropriate bodies, um, Water Safety Scotland, etc. I know Morris is on the cross-party group. So, yeah, I mean, uh, every every sympathy with this petition and, and yeah, agree with, with what her okay. calls. Morris? Yes, um, I mean, thank you. Yes, uh, as, as Gail Brightner said, I'm on the, on the vice convener of the, the cross-party group uh, for prevention of accidents. Um, Yes, one of the issues we're looking at is, is the fact that there, it, by under, there is no requirement under statute for local authorities to have a water safety um, policy in relation to coastal or inland waters. Um, only three at the moment uh, have got one, um, or very nearly got one. Um, so it's something we're pushing from that point of view in ROSPA. Um, when I asked the government in the questions which you've seen here, uh, uh, clearly it's very much left to the councils to, to, to do what they see appropriate. But I think it's got beyond that now, and I think we need to ask the Scottish Government from a national level, uh, you know, a little bit more pressure maybe on the, on, on the local authorities to address these issues, because mm -hmm. um, we see it all the time with damaged, vandalised uh, life belts are not there, or yeah. the ropes are not there. And what this lady, the petitioner, said is absolutely right. Yeah. Um, to give an example, very, very quickly, um, we, the, the ROSPA launched a, thing, a, a petition this last year to do with water safety in relation to beach toys and, and requesting people to keep beach toys back uh, in for the pool and not for the beach. Are these ones that float away and kids get sadly get nearly drowned or drowned. Um, we've discovered that there is a distinct drop in the number of call-outs from the lifeboats this year, this, this last 12 months, or last six months. So there's something happening. So I think it's a question of really challenging the government here to see what we can do mm -hmm. uh, to encourage the local authorities, maybe through COSLA and everything else, Kavina. So that's my take on it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I was quite interested in, well, two things, that the idea that we should be highlighting just how unacceptable it is to tamper wa with water safety equipment, why anybody yeah. would do that, heaven yeah. alone knows, but really to bring to public attention just what the very serious impact of that can be. Um, and there is an issue around, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of this is done in our schools already, but that would be one thing. But the other thing was just that, you know, looking at life-saving equipment that goes beyond throwing out um, a, a, a belt. And I think there's some really interesting, I'm sure a lot of this has been done, but I think it highlights the way in which people are thinking about how um, wow. you can, you can um, prevent tragedy. And I think that's also been um, very useful. I mean, we say, obviously we're all struck by the fact that this comes from um, the petitioner's direct personal experience. And again, we rec recognise it's often in these petitions the courage that people show and taking out of their own experience and a desire to um, prevent it happening to anybody else. And, you know, obviously um, it's unfortunate that the petitioner isn't able to be here today and we can understand why. 
it might be if, if she thought it useful that perhaps a couple of us could meet with her um, to talk through some of, of the issues that she has highlighted in petitions so that we can ensure that's um, put into the system as well. But that would very much a matter for her. But I do think, you know, I think we're all struck by just... This is something that, that sadly happens too often. And if there are practical measures that could be taken to help, we would obviously be supportive of that. So I think we are agreeing tonight, Scottish Government... Um, the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents, Water Safety Scotland, um, and we can then reflect on the responses we get after that. Is that agreed? Agreed. Yes, agreed. Okay. Thank you for that. If we can now move on to the, the third new petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1771 on potential abuse within Scottish, lo Scottish local authorities lodged by William Tate, which calls the Scottish Government to close or overhaul COSLA and review and rewrite the remit of the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman in relation to council complaints. In 1975, COSLA was set up to act as a national voice for local government in Scotland. It is politically led, cross-party organisation, and currently represents all 32 local authorities uh, on a Scottish, UK and European level. COSLA works with the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament to influence public policy and represent the views of Scottish communities. The organisation encourages political consensus and continuous improvement. Our briefing note for this petition goes on to explain that while the Scottish Government can make changes to the structure and role of local government, it is not responsible for the formation of COSLA and it would not be able to close or overhaul COSLA as it did not establish it. The SPSO has a wide remit covering a variety of functions and services but has three distinct areas of statutory function. The SPSO is the final stage for complaints about most devolved public services in Scotland. The SPSO also has specific powers and responsibilities to publish complaints handling procedures and to monitor and support best practice in complaints handling. It is also the independent reviewer of the Scottish Welfare Fund with the power to overturn and substitute decisions made by councils on community care and crisis grant applications. The SPSO is independent of government and has a duty to act impartially. While the Scottish Government can legislate for changes to the powers of the SPSO, it does not scrutinise the Ombudsman. Members will note that we have before us a written submission in hard copy from Ewan Cameron, who is supportive of the action called for in the petition. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Yeah, I, mean, I, I would declare to commit that Mr Cameron's a, a constituent of mine, um, and I've, I've actually been acting on his, his behalf on this particular, uh, on this particular issue. Um, what I would say in, in, in the, the, the correspondence that, that I have been, um, I've had with uh, some government ministers about this, I did find it quite difficult to get any information back on behalf of my constituent. That's the one thing I would say. I'm not suggesting anything other than that, but I do think that um, they do need to have a look at, at, at when, uh, when asked for information by the general public uh, and myself or, or, or MSPs. That they do they do look at how they deliver that information because there does seem to be a reticence on their part to go into any great detail. So. Um, whether, whether or not there's a there's a, a case to be answered here is, is obviously what we're looking looking into just now. But my initial thoughts on this, as I say, is, is that uh, there's information is not free flowing. Let's put it that way. Information on what? Sorry, particularly. Well, we, we're, if you, uh, if you look, we we asked for some uh, uh, written to both. At the time, it was Michael Matheson at the time, uh, when, and uh, also uh, Annabel Ewing. Um, and the, 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 the both replied, the prize back seemed to be slightly uh, at odds with each, with each other um, around the, the funding and also around the accountability. Um, Sorry, can I clarify? Are you speaking about the written submission or the yes, petitioner? Yeah, well, I, the I am. The extra written submission. Yeah, the extra written submission, yes. Um, which which is how I know about this petition. I didn't know that, 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 that when this petition came in, I was aware that uh, I, of my constituent. And then obviously this this, uh, this arrived this arrived quite late as well, so mm -hmm. um, not particularly surprised to see uh, so, him writing it. So do you support. think that, sorry, that the issues that we don't want to go into details of a um, a case that's not the, the petition themselves, yeah. but would those matters be resolved by closing COSLA? 
No, or getting I, rid I, I, of or reviewing the remit of the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. No, I, mean, I, th I think I think you know my, my personal view in this is is, is the the call to to close Cosla is not one that's that, that's going to fly, mm -hmm. um, um, or, or or even you know, overhaul it. I think my my feeling in this is is that um, there was a, ret a reticence to to engage uh, specifically in, in, in just allowing it, uh, information to flow. Um, in terms of reviewing the, the, the SPSO, I mean, I, I would hope that the SPSO um, is constantly under under looking at the, the way in which, which it operates, given given its role within public life. Um, and uh, I don't think there's any harm in writing to them with with that with that ask. But in terms of, we, I think we you know we can we can discuss this if you like. But closing causal is not going to fly at all, and. That would be a very retrograde step, I would have mm. thought, in any, in any case. Um, okay. But if they're not operating in the way that they, they, they should operate, I think that, that, that's, that's a different matter. I suppose the question is whether an organisation and body is not operating properly in the view of an individual experience or whether as an yeah. organisation yeah. is functioning, although individuals yeah. may be disappointed mm -hmm. with it, which is perhaps... I think that's, the, that's, what, that's what we need to. I think exact, that's exactly right. Whether this is an individual case or whether, or whether uh, there's something more substantial to that question. Okay, Gail. Um, yeah, I think as well, convener, that you you mentioned in the opening to this petition. It's also in our papers about what powers the Scottish government has to close or overhaul Cosla, mm -hmm. which it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's whether or not. <coughs> what the petition is trying to achieve can be achieved and I don't see that it can be with the powers that are currently available. Okay. Other views? Yes, I would agree with that, Convener. I think, if I may turn to the SPSO, I mean, the Local Government and Communities Committee have a scrutiny on this annually, so I think there's a safeguard there for that um, point of view from that position, just to clarify that. Read, with Codsler, obviously it's set up by Codsler's, I'm sorry, by the members of, of Codsler. Um, and um, you know, I think that uh, you know we have to be very careful because you know delegated authority to local authorities, etc. So we come through a whole mandate as issues, and I think it may be that this petitioner has had a an issue, a one sin individual issue, and therefore hasn't been happy with the outcome of it. Um, but then, unfortunately, it happens in some situations. So he has a way of redressing that by going through the normal channels. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's important for us not to misrepresent what this. Petitions Committee can do as well, so um, COSLA will continue. Um, I wonder whether um, it may be appropriate really to flag up to the local government committee that yeah. there's been this concern around mm -hmm. SPSO. This is an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was involved a long time ago with a review of all the public bodies and ombudsmen and all, and all the rest of it. So I think, that, you know, to have a sense of how that is... Um, but you're saying specifically they have the job in relation to SPSO. Yes, exactly. So it may be simply... I mean, realistically, um, notwithstanding the individual issue that Brian Whittle flags up, um, in terms of uh, in terms of what Gail has said, that um, you know it's not within the powers of the Scottish government to get rid of COSLA. The SPSO, there's a specific <coughs> mechanism exactly. for reviewing its exactly. work. Um, what we, we we could do is to to close the petition, <coughs> but in doing so write to the local government committee and just flag up to them that this has been an issue yes. and that in their review of the work of the SPSO we would yeah. be keen that they would yeah. reflect on that and obviously um, the, the, the paperwork that we have here would be available to them. Yeah. Agreed. Would that be acceptable? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. So, and that's notwithstanding the individual circumstances yeah. that people experience um, with SPSO or with COS or whomsoever. Just, just to reiterate um, that, uh, that the Mr. State is, is uh, a, a constituent of mine and, and uh, he has various constituency issues which we resolved and so, um, you know, we've obviously been in contact similarly, like Brian, um, they fall into the Okay, uh, in that case I think we're agreeing to close the petition. We recognise the issues that have been flagged up. Um, I think that, um, that in closing the petition we would write to the Local Government Committee and highlight to them um, the importance of the scrutiny of, of the SPSO role, and particularly in terms of the experience of individual constituents who've expressed concerns. And we want to thank the petitioner for um, lodging the petition 
And of course, you know, in a year's time, if you feel that there hasn't been progress around, I think specifically around the issue of SPSO, they would be entitled to lodge another petition. OK, we can now move on to the next petition for consideration today, which is petition 1774 on formally recording the formally record vaping-related illnesses and deaths lodged by Craig Edward, which calls the Scottish Government to collect data on vaping-related illnesses and vaping during pregnancy to ensure the best health interventions are provided to all. As a briefing note explains, because of the known harms of smoking, data tends to track prevalence of smoking and cessation via surveys. Maternal smoking rates are recorded by NHS Information Services Division from information collected antenatally. The Scottish Public Health Observatory provides sources of data on smoking, as well as smoking-related illness and behaviour. The observatory also provides information and data on illnesses related to smoking, such as cancers and COPD. Not enough is known about vaping to make any direct causal links to particular diseases or conditions. The Scottish Government, in response to a question about the recording of health harms, stated that, as yet, there was no international coding for harms relating to vaping. However, in October 2019, guidance was issued to enable the coding of health harms linked to vaping under existing codes. And I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, for me, there are, there are two, there's two different aspects to, to the vaping. There's obviously the uh, smoking cessation aspect to it, which, which is uh, very heavily played across the whole vaping uh, uh, <coughs> sort of, uh, companies. And which is an intervention really around um, an NHS intervention, which uh, I think I think probably would all support. There's the other the other thing that always sits in my sticks in, in, in my, my throat is the fact that vaping uh, products are owned by tobacco companies in the main. So this idea that uh, uh, you know, tobacco companies are are you know, trying to prevent people smoking doesn't fly either <laughs> that, that's a, so there's two completely separate si si situations here and I think that the, the petitioner is absolutely right we don't have any evidence of the the negative effects of um, consist consistent consistently uh, vaping um, you know personally I think if you're gonna if you're gonna inhale anything into your lungs you know that's not supposed to be there it, it's not going to be great for you but um, I think that uh, over over time and we've seen in the United States over time that uh, they're starting to link certain health issues with vaping. It's uh, so I, I, I am uh, I'm very sympathetic to the the, the, uh, the petitioners' uh, petition, and uh, my suggestion would be to write again to the Scottish Government to see whether they're going to um, take up the the petition, but uh, petitioner suggestion, but also link it in with. There's a lot of work been done in the US on this. Um, and I say, and certainly, I'd like to make the distinction between using vaping as a smoking cessation uh, mechanism and vaping for vaping's sake, um, because they're two completely different things. Okay. Any other views, David? Thank you, convener. Um, I would support Brian there, but my main concern is the number of uh, people who are now buying it on the internet and it's unregulated, and you don't know what's in it. Um, so my concerns are in that area. Um, so I'd, I would like to, like Brian. I'd like to see um, what effect it's having on individuals. Okay, Gail. Can I just um, follow that up? Um, vaping products is regulated at a UK level, so maybe we should be writing to the UK government to find out if they've got any plans to regulate that. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a kind of... <coughs> it comes out in the paperwork, doesn't it, that if it uses um, the harmful effects of smoking to prevent them, it's a positive thing. There's some anecdotal evidence that young people vape, even though they had never smoked, although the advice is not don't vape unless you're trying to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose the kind of the concern would, or the balance is something that's not good for you, but it's stopping you doing something even worse. Mm -hmm. um, um, is is, is the, the trade-off that people are going to be making all the time. But I think we're agreed there is an issue here um, and that we would want to write the Scottish Government um, the relevant body at a UK level um, seeking its view in the action called for on the petition. Agreed. That's agreed. Yep. agreed. OK, in that case, if we can move on. The final new petition for consideration today is petition 1774 on introduced statutory allergy care legislation in nurseries and schools lodged by Katrina Drummond. 
The petition calls on the Scottish Government to pass legislation that will make an allergy care policy statutory for every nursery and school and to establish appropriate standards for nursery and school staff of medical training, education and care for children with anaphylaxis. Concerns about the treatment of anaphylaxis in schools grew after the tragic death of a boy in a school in London in 2017. Following the inquest, the coroner raised concerns that pupils' court had a patchy understanding of his allergies, what they were and the consequence of exposure to allergens. The coroner was also concerned about the school's care plan. Following the coroner's conclusion, the anaphylaxis campaign established its Making Schools Safer project to support schools' allergy awareness and planning. Scottish Government guidance supporting children and young people with health care needs in schools provides detailed guidance for schools in early learning and childcare centres on the use of adrenaline auto-injectors, for example, EpiPens in schools. From 1st October 2017, schools are allowed to obtain without a prescription adrenaline auto-injector devices if they wish for use in emergencies. The guidance notes that any member of staff can volunteer for training but cannot be forced to do so and that schools should ensure there are a reasonable number of designated members of staff to provide sufficient coverage. The guidance, which is also applicable to early learning and childcare centres, states schools must arrange specialist anaphylaxis training for staff where a pupil in the school has been diagnosed as being at risk of anaphylaxis. The specialist training should include practical instruction in how to use the different adrenaline auto-injector devices available. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Gail? Yes, convener. Um, if you don't mind, I'll start this one off, given that I have actually been named um, as uh, the MSP that has been dealing with this for Katrina, who's my constituent. And I want to um, start by thanking her for, um, for getting in touch. Um, we have received a response from the local authority and without going into details of the particular case that we've been dealing with, I can um, report back to the committee um, what the Highland Council's policy is and where we are taking that um, to try and move on. Uh, so just to quote from the Highland Council's response, it says the implementation protocol and procedure in the case of severe allergies begins at the time of enrolment which is in most cases six months prior to the child starting in the setting. It begins with effective communication between the health visitor as the key person and the setting manager to ensure that they can plan for any child transitioning into the setting. In severe cases, there should also be a letter from a paediatrician detailing the diagnosed allergy with recommended guidance on how best to manage the diagnosis. A child's plan meeting with relevant health professionals in attendance takes place identifying and implementing a plan to meet the individual needs of the child, including specific allergy or anaphylaxis training for staff and a robust risk assessment of the setting. They also say we are committed to ensuring that staff have access to anaphylaxis training as required. The protocols which are in place are also monitored and approved by the care inspectorate. In addition to this, the Highland Council catering team are currently developing specific allergy awareness training for early years practitioners and there is an online course which staff undertake as an introduction to the topic. Um, so we have actually written back with another set of questions which we are waiting for a response um, on who delivers the anaphylaxis training. Um, is it a health and safety professional who carries out the risk assessment and just the communication? But, I mean, as the petitioner states, there is no statutory training. I think it's on a, uh, an application basis. Um, so, I mean, certainly from my point of view, I would be inclined to write back as a committee to the Highland Council to get an update on where we are with the training, you know, in response to the petitioner herself, but also write to the government and just to ask, should there be a, a, a statutory responsibility on these staff to undertake this as a, a, a part of their, their training overall? Um, and I would actually be quite <coughs> concerned that if there was something that had maybe been missed or, or if there had been training that had been due to take place and for some reason that staff member had been absent or, you know, just anything that had fallen through the net when, when a, a training is not mandatory, um, especially with something as serious as an allergy that could affect a child's life. So 
I would really want to follow that up with the Scottish Government as well. Okay. I mean, obviously, we're not taking up an individual case, but we're taking no, no. up the general Absolutely. concerns that emerge from well, that. We don't know who else this affects yeah, Scotland yeah. wide. So, and so certainly, in terms, because the Highland Council specifically mentioned the petition, it would I think your updates would be very helpful, and we could maybe um, really just write as a committee to them and ask for that that information. Brian. <sighs> I mean, it's, 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 it's one, one, this is one of these petitions that, that, that kind of raises an eyebrow because you know this is, you should never assume. But I would have assumed that that uh, this, this kind of training was 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 already standard yeah. within within these uh, these kind of settings. So uh, if it's not, um, if, um, Mark, and if we're going to write to Highland Council, it'd be interesting to compare that with what other councils yeah. mm -hmm. um, are, are actually doing or not doing. Um, because it does seem reasonable to me that uh, that kind of cover is available mm -hmm. within... We know, do it worthwhile in the first instance writing to cause, like I said, this may be, yeah. there may be a general issue. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking back to my own time in teaching and how little even awareness you were given, you know, like a child had yeah. epilepsy and all you had to say were... Or, or diabetes, or you can have a banana. I mean, I, I'm always struck by how little actually you knew you're sitting with all these young people in front of you. And I'm sure it's moved a million miles since then. And some of the information is simply about being alert and referring, get the young person to the right person to help them. So there's somebody within the, the setting that, that, that knows how much is it is about general information for staff and how much is the, the specific training. And I suppose it's getting that balance right yeah. as well no, yeah. not, 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 not to widen this out any further no please don't <laughs> yes <laughs> but in, in, in our day there was a school nurse say no more <laughs> <laughs> you're generous to say <coughs> our day there but never mind convener I was just David. going to ask is there not in these is schools designated first aiders it would be interesting to find out if they're trained in it because they should yeah. be because most youth organisations or other organisations these designated first yeah. aid trainers yeah. are trained in yeah. it mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my wife's a first aider at her school and a primary school in Hellsborough, um, and I know that um, she does have has been told of certain cases of, of particular whatever the issue is, uh, and is ready for that. And they are given specific training, but I don't think it's the same throughout. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we write to Colza and say, look, what's the situation for, you know, and filter it down that way. Mm -hmm. Individual yeah. councils, as Gail said, I think that would be the first approach we take to try and get a handle on this. Okay, so I think we're, we're agreeing there is an issue here. There's very helpful information and update been given by Gail about, about Highland, but we are agreeing to write to them specifically because um, they were mentioned, but we want to write to COSLA to sort of just a general sense of their response to this petition. And also getting the balance right between is it the proposal in the petition, the way it's going, you know, having a statutory responsibility or whatever, is that the way forward? Is there some other way in which it can be done? And we welcome the comments on that and also to write to the Scottish Government to highlight these issues as well, yep. if that's okay. agreed. Yep, that's okay, right. I'm going to suspend briefly before we move on to agenda item two.
Okay. If I can call a meeting back to order. Um, we're now moving on to agenda item two, consideration of continued petitions. The first continued petition for consideration today is petition 1577 on adult cerebral palsy lodged by Rachel Wallace, which calls the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to develop and provide funding for a clinical pathway and services for adults with cerebral palsy. At our last consideration of this petition, the Scottish Government was aiming to publish a neurological action plan following consultation with stakeholders. As such, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government seeking an update on the timescales for publication of the neurological action plan, to what extent the neurological action plan will address the action called for in the petition, and the explicit inclusion of cerebral palsy within the action plan and the petitioner to find out whether they were involved with or were consulted on the new Neurological Action Plan. The Neurological Action Plan was published as the Neurological Care and Support Framework for Action 2020-2025 on 18 December 2019. The petitioner advised they had not been involved in drafting the National Action Plan or consulted on it. The petitioner has been trying to arrange a meeting with the Clinical Priorities team to discuss this, but they wanted to wait for the action plan to be published. The petitioner also had personal and work commitments which prevented this from happening. The Scottish Government response notes that the plan is not condition specific, advising it covers neuro conditions as defined by the World Health Organisation. The petitioner raises concerns that the plan was to be non-condition specific, noting, quote, I fail to see how non-condition specific plans will solve the issues raised in this petition. A cerebral palsy and the people living with it are unique. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, well, I think there's, like, there's, there's a couple of things um, strike me. One is to um, ask the petitioner their views on the, 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 the care and support framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, basically just ask the Scottish Government if, if they will properly engage with the petitioner seems a, a reasonable ask. Mm -hmm. It feels as if there's been a kind of a... It's like the conversation is almost missing the point. Yes, absolutely. You know, the, 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 the petition has consistently made the point that cerebral palsy is not properly understood. There's not a specific pathway. Um, and the response is, it comes back always, well, these are general things which encapsulates it. And yeah. I just feel as if it's almost... You know, it's not that there's uh, ill intent, but just simply it's almost been at the... The conversation is not really, um, it's as if the Scottish Government's not quite getting what it is that the petitioner is, is asking for. So I think that to, to ask the Scottish Government to engage with the petition would be really, really yeah. um, useful and to try and get a positive response. And we recognise there has been a number of reasons why that ha hasn't happened thus far, but it does feel to me the underlying thing, there's not really been an acceptance that there's a specific issue about this particular condition yeah. that is... That is you know, driven the petition in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, 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 we obviously we're not medical in that. No. I, 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 can't, I can't make comment on, you know, a, a specific uh, condition, but um, I don't think it should be, at the very least, the petitioner's concerns should be listened to by the Scottish Government. In that can I respect. suggest that we write specifically, to, we can get advice on who the, the relevant minister would be, but to write directly to the minister may yep. be um, a way of perhaps... Um, yeah. Sort of dealing with that question of the the fact that the, the discussion is is kind of you know missing the point in a way, but to specifically task the minister to engage with the petition, I think that might be the Agreed. most productive. Yeah, um, is there anything else we could do? I think we are agreeing to write again to the petitioner. You know, to, and they have made the point. I think the specific point about it not recognising the unique nature of cerebral palsy. Um, so I think we can ask for an update from them, um, but they would do a right to the relevant minister to draw attention to petition and ask that they engage. Is that agreed? Yeah, absolutely. OK, with that, can we then move on to the second continued petition for consideration today, which is petition 1629 on MRI scans for ocular melanoma sufferers in Scotland, lodged by Jennifer Lewis. At our last consideration of this petition, we heard evidence from Dr Couchy in his capacity as clinical oncologist at Garton Naval General Hospital and his role in leading the work of the Scottish Group for consensus on met metatastic surveillance for veal melanoma. 
At this meeting, the committee agreed to reflect on the evidence heard at a future meeting. It also agreed to write to the petitioner, NHS England and Dr Couchy. The committee has received written responses from the petitioner, two submissions from Dr Couchy, NHS England and Ian Galloway. These are summarised in the clerk's papers. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, I think that since um, we had the doctor in to give us evidence, there is, you know, he's he's challenged some of the um, prevailing opinions about what's offered elsewhere and and you know what what's the best uh, course of action for patients here and and I don't know I found his his evidence to committee and also the follow up written evidence to be quite compelling actually and. Um, I think he puts forward um, exactly what is happening and and how that's being worked in, in various hospitals. I mean, I do take on the petitioner's response to say that, you know, the specific hospitals that they had asked to be um, looked at were not looked at, but I, I don't know. I think that we have, certainly from my point of view, enough information in front of us now to maybe not completely satisfied, but almost put the petition to bed because it, I think that the, the points have been addressed as much as they can be. Okay, other views? Um, I would agree with Gail, convener, I would agree with Gail on that. And, and uh, I think the, the presentation that um, uh, Dr. Couchy gave when he came here before the committee was very good. Uh, obviously a lot of work has gone forward from that um, by him um, and the examination of other areas and, and I'm, I'm quite satisfied that there's been big leaps and bounds in Scotland and I think the change of regime at the Gart Naval has actually uh, helped that situation to come forward to have these six monthly scans etc. So I, I'm, comf I'm comfortable with um, on the basis as, as Gil said of, of looking to close the petition because I think we've really taken this as far as we can go. And you know the, the medical advice we've been given and by the specialist is, is, is very clear. Okay, Brian. Yeah, I think that you know, I think we, we, when this petition first came uh, to us, it's, it's, it struck us as, as uh, um, slightly odd that that uh, a certain um, um, sort of methodology and treatment wasn't being offered in Scotland that it was in England. It, was, it struck me as there's quite a lot of sort of um, discrepancy in the the evidence that came back in terms of you know what's offered down south as compared to up here. But what the petitioner has done, in my in my view, is is raised an issue um, uh, to, to, to a level where, where change has happened. That's not me, by the way, that's the thing. Change has happened, and, uh, and, and significant change has happened. So I, I think from the petitioner's perspective, we'd like to thank the petitioner, for, obviously, mm -hmm. for doing that, because uh, as I said, there's the significant progress that's been made. And I would agree it would be difficult for us to take it any further than than it, than, than it have, have have already. But uh, I think we have to note that there's, as I said, that there has that the petition. I think has de definitely driven change change in this area. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I, mean, I, so, I mean, I was struck by the concerns of Dr. Couch and the implication that they felt that this had been a reflection. Um, on their team, and I don't think anybody, including the petitioner, would, would want to do that. But there was a very specific issue about whether um, there was a, a process available in other parts of, of Britain that weren't available in Scotland. And there, I think there's still some question around that, because I think that the petitioner suggests that even if a particular hospital doesn't provide the service, they could be referred elsewhere. Um, so I think there's, you know, th th that's clearly um, still an issue. Um, I think one view is that in terms of um, what can further be done, I think the petitioner has been very effective in highlighting this <coughs> in an area that, you know, well, certainly it's not something why we did, was not something I knew anything about. And I think that that awareness raising has been very important. It has asked people involved in the system to, to really focus on, on those concerns. And there has been progress, and I, and I certainly hope that there can be... Um, Further progress, um, my sense is I think we feel as a committee that at this stage there isn't anything further we can do. We think the petition, in a sense, has served its purpose that it is sought to do, which is to highlight 
um, perhaps gaps in provision. Mm -hmm. And there is no doubt that um, both the petitioner has been very engaged with us, but also so has um, Dr Couch and his colleagues. In fact, that we got evidence and we got two further submissions recognises that they're taking it seriously as well. And I think we would find that exceptionally encouraging. And I would underline that we had certainly at no point, and I'm sure not the petitioners either, were wanting to call into question the, the commitment of um, the service to, to their patients. Mm -hmm. But I think we would agree that we would want to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders, recognising the significant work has been undertaken to explore the issue, which has concluded in a consensus statement that all patients with reveal melanoma should be offered six monthly surveillance for liver metastasis the first 10 years after diagnosis, and all new patients in Scotland are now offered prognostic diopsies. Um, and I think in doing so, we would want to thank the petitioner again, um, I think for giving very powerful evidence when they came and being um, very engaged with the committee, and it, as indeed as I've highlighted, as have the clinicians, um, and obviously to say that um, in a year's time, there's an opportunity for the petitioner um, to bring back a petitioner if they felt there hasn't been the progress that the, their petition warranted and want to thank them very much for being engaged with the process. Absolutely. That's agreed. Yeah, agreed. OK, in that case, if we can move on. The next continued petition for consideration today is Petition 1683 on support or for families with multiple births, lodged by Jennifer Edmonston. We last considered this petition at our meeting on 5th September 2019 when we agreed to write to the Minister for Children and Young People to establish what assessment the Scottish Government had made of the impact multiple births could have on all families, not just those in lower incomes, and the support available to them. The Committee has now received written responses from the Minister for Children and Young People and the petitioner. These are summarised in the Clark's papers. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. For what it's worth, my frustration with this is I don't think that the Minister for Children and Young People is engaged with what the actual question is. It is about what we do generally. I think we were specifically seeing what assessment has been made of the impact of a multiple birth on a family. And I don't I don't I don't think that, that they've engaged in that discussion at all. And I think that's reflected in the frustration from the petitioner and the issues that have been that have been highlighted. I mean interest in other views, my own feeling that it might be worthwhile simply inviting the Minister for Children and Young People to come in to give evidence. We provide an opportunity to outline, um, as they have done in written form, what has actually been done for families, but also to just have that conversation about what they're looking at in terms of um, the impact specifically of multiple births, yeah. which is, a, a, it can, you know, we're not talking about um, it kind of an impact on families not regardless of income, but of when people who are maybe just above um, very low-income families. I can cover that. I think that um, in, in, in her response, I think the, the Minister's missed the point a wee bit. Uh, and it would just be probably, we could probably make it, uh, the, the process a little bit quicker, bringing the Minister here and actually allowing her to, to, to answer directly the, mm. the, the points that the petitioner makes. I, I, I would concur that bringing the Minister in would be a good move. Okay, so that I'd agree with that. Um, yeah, I would just say that um, I'm not sure if she's actually completely missed a point. I think she's laid out that there are a lot of help for families, but as the convener has stated, low-income families, um, she does acknowledge that none of the support mechanisms operating currently treat multiple births as a criteria for support. So I think that that's maybe something that we need to flesh out. Yeah. Because that is the very point that the petitioner is making, is that Absolutely. there is an argument to be made that when you're targeting support, this is a particular group where there's a direct impact that perhaps they hadn't planned for, um, and just Indeed. simply a recognition of that. But I think we're agreed that this continues to be a petition that um, raises interesting issues, um, and that it would be really useful to have the Minister um, in order to have that kind of further conversation with her about what the Scottish Government might be able to do. Mm -hmm. If that's agreed. OK, in that case, if we can move on. The next continued petition for consideration today is Petition 1699 on the release of murder victim bodies for funeral arrangements lodged by Amanda Digby. We last considered this petition on 27th of June 2019. At that meeting, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government to seek its views on the suggestions outlined in the Law Society of Scotland's written submission of 15 October 2018. 
The committee also agreed to ask the Scottish Government for its reflections on the petitioner's concerns about the monitoring of a new consultation protocol, including whether this could potentially lead to more cases being treated as special cases. Responses have now been been provided from the Scottish Government and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. A further written submission was sought from the petitioner, but this has not been received. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Well, note no, that uh, there's a, there's, uh, there's a consultation protocol has recently been uh, published by the Crown Office uh, and the Procurator Fiscal Service. So, and in light of that, it may be uh, in consideration now that that that, that uh, we looked to, to to close the petition, and because uh, obviously that the the response to uh, not necessarily the response to the petition, but in this particular instance, uh, you know, the new, the new rules have actually been uh, recently published. So, I think from the petition's petition's perspective, it would be very difficult to get that moved any time soon, I would have thought, mm -hmm. in that respect. Mm -hmm. I think we could definitely, you know, uh, look, look to maybe write to the Scottish Government to see what support and, and commitment they can have in liaising with the Law Society and making sure that the public understand, that married relatives understand um, the, the time, the post-mortem uh, and, and how this works. Uh, I think that would be helpful because it seems to me that part of the issue is around uh, a, a lack of understanding of, of process. There was, I mean, I, I should declare an interest as somebody who, along with the petitioner, attended a meeting with um, the Lord Advocate and the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and there was a recognition that was an issue. I think probably part of it was not really, what wasn't, wasn't clear was what was driving the delays. Mm. So there was an, an issue about, you know, Defence Council have the right to have another post-mortem, which, you know, it doesn't happen in other parts of the United Kingdom, it's possible... Have, so the protocol was addressing some of that, um, but it's whether there was an issue about whether there's sufficient people who are able to, to carry out these post-mortems yeah. and, and if it's been driven by a lack of resource or um, just simply process. But I was struck by the fact that there was a recognition that what the family had experienced um, was a real problem and they were very sympathetic and empathetic. But I suppose the question would be whether that protocol actually in effect works out. Um, and I'm wondering whether, you know, I, I think I agree with the suggestion that we close the petition, but this would be a particularly good example of where the petitioner, along with others, may wish to kind of keep a close eye on this. And if they feel that that hasn't worked um, or there is continued to be a problem, this is something that yeah. could be Absolutely. brought back to the attention um, um, of the petitioner. Mm -hmm. But also, I think, to try the Scottish Government in closing the petition, asking them to highlight this issue, about making sure that there is sufficient public information. Because, again, one of the problems, I think, was that people were told, well, there's nothing we can do about this. This is just the way it is. Mm. And it turned out that, actually, that wasn't just the way it was. There was reasons behind it, um, which I think the protocol is, is seeking to address. So if that were agreed... Sorry, uh, Morris. Can, yeah. uh, can I also say in the information is I think also the uh, Association of Funer Funeral Directors, because people obviously go to them and they have a very um, a heavy, a strong part to play when somebody's bereaved, as, you, as we know. Um, and it might be um, just include them in the sort of information about when, if this, this situation occurs, how they can address that with the families. Because, I mean, sometimes people might engage very quickly when somebody passes on, and then, of course, they get down the process of post-mortem and that. Would that be possible? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we can flag up to the Scottish Government there's a whole range of groups that should be made aware yes, of these issues. Yes. But I think that that very specific question about where someone has been a murder victim and you're being told, well, you may not have you know, your, your, your loved one back because... You know, what feels like a very cold process yeah. and really the, the question was whether that was absolutely necessary but I think we can flag that up in any correspondence yes. we send yes, okay. if that's agreed and again we would want, I think in closing the petition we'd want to thank the petitioner uh, very much for in very difficult circumstances highlighting a, an important issue and recognising that they did secure um, 
you, you know, they secured a meeting with the Lord Advocate and, and, and a recognition that what they're raising was a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. And, of course, to highlight that there is an opportunity in a year's time to bring back a petition if they feel it hasn't been addressed sufficiently. Yeah. And to thank them for their engagement with us. If we can now move on to the next continued petition, which is for consideration today, which is petition 1722 on parking charges at Island Lifeline Ferry Ports, lodged by Dr Shona Ruman on behalf of Iona and Mull Community Councils and others. We last considered this petition in June when we agreed to seek written views on the petition, specifically on why island community impact assessments have not been brought into force as detailed in the Island Scotland Act 2018, and also why Argyll and Butte Council had introduced car parking charges in Iona and Mull. Responses have now been received from the Scottish Government, Argyll and Butte Council, Cal Mac Ferry, Shetland Islands Council, Orkney Islands Council, Marie Todd MSP, Liam MacArthur MSP and the petitioner. Mike Russell MSP has also contacted Clarks to highlight his strong support for the action called for in the petition and I wonder if members have any comment or suggestions for action. Yeah, I mean, I've, I find the fact that Argyll and Butte Council didn't take impact assessments into account with this particular issue, even though it, it, it hasn't come into um, statute yet, they know it's coming and they know that it's going to have to be done. And I just, I, yeah, I just find the whole thing um, to be... Um, I completely understand where community councils are coming from. I mean, there has been a kind of backtracking and uh, an apology and a um, admittance that they didn't carry out the process um, the way they should have done. Um, I don't think that that has satisfied the petitioner because they then go on to state that the, the discounts are a temporary measure and... Um, as we can see, we've had a lot of representation from, um, well, the other two island authorities and MSPs as well. Um, as to where we go with this, um, I think it's a, a difficult one again because, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about local authorities and what they feel that they need to do. Um, I think that we should be writing back to the Scottish Government because there are other things now that, that this has thrown up in relation to the Islands Act, certainly from um, Shetland Islands Council as well. Okay, Brian. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Gail uh, Ross um, highlights an issue here. There's a, there's a dilemma here because obviously there's, there's a high degree of autonomy for local councils to, to set their own rules and regulations. But against that, of course, is that uh, I think the island communities are particularly vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, in, in this particular uh, circumstances, and that they have no choice but to use to use the service because they haven't got a choice to do anything else. So, I, I agree. I agree with Gil Ross that I think that we do need to write to the Scottish government in this particular uh, instance uh, to, to seek the views, given especially that the, the representation from. Um, nearly all the MSPs that, uh, from those communities. Um, because I think that if we're going to maintain our, our uh, communities on the islands, mm -hmm. they're going to have to be specifically supported. And this, to me, seems like uh, a, an issue that we should be able to resolve. So mm -hmm. I would agree that we, we write to the Scottish Government again. OK. I mean, I was surprised that legislation came in in 2008 and they've not enacted, which is the core bit... Yeah. It's absolutely the core bit of the legislation that there's an island impact assessment. Um, I, so it would be worth asking them why that's a delay. And while, yes, it's reasonable to say, well, they know it's coming. If everybody knows it's coming, why is it not already arrived? Um, it's quite significant. I think there's two government ministers in there arguing for this. So presumably they can use their influence. Um, but I wonder whether there's something underpinning this. And we may not agree this as a committee. Why would, anybody, why would any local authority do this? I think there's at least some suggestion they're doing it because of pressures on their budgets. So the thing that goes along with that for me, if we have an island impact assessment, there has been understanding of the specific funding needs of local authorities in island and remote communities, that, which I presume is the driver behind, again, behind the legislation to understand that. And I suppose that would be something that we could flag up um, to the, the Scottish Government as well. So I think we're... 
um, again, throughout the Scottish Government, secret views in the matters have been highlighted, um, and you know, to, you know, as we've discussed, to think about when are they bringing this forward, mm -hmm. and how how will they address a specific issue around funding, which is particularly in, in a challenge for island communities. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. In that case, if we can move on to the next petition. A uh, continued petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1723 on Essential Tremor Treatment in Scotland, lodged by Mary Ramsey. And can I welcome Rhoda Grant, MSP, uh, who is attending for the consideration of this petition. We last considered this petition in September, when we agreed to write to the Scottish Government and Dr Gilbertson, NHS Tayside. The committee also agreed to delegate authority to the Clarks to write to other relevant stakeholders. Responses have been received from the Scottish Government, NHS Tayside, Sue Ryder, the National Tremor Foundation and the petitioner. NHS Tayside note magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound, MRGFUS, is a technology which has significant potential as a treatment for patients with essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. NHS Tayside are in the advanced stages of achieving their funding, their fundraising target for acquisition of the MRG FUS equipment and its installation. The Scottish Government submission notes the National Specialist Services Committee met on 4th December 2018 to consider a stage one application for specialist treatment of patients with essential tremor using MRG, MRG FUS. The committee was unable to endorse the application for funding as a nationally designated service. It was highlighted that NICE guidance is permissive, and while there is some evidence for use of MRGFUS in essential tremor, there is a clear statement that research is needed into its application for Parkinson's disease and MS tremor. I wonder whether it might be worthwhile asking Rhoda Grant to contribute at this point before we have a further discussion in the petition. Yes, I mean, you, you'll have seen also um, Mary Ramsey has come back to the committee and just described her own situation, and this obviously won't help Mary, but she has gone through the process of having electrodes placed in her brain, and she can see very clearly that having this treatment would have been a game changer for her, and for other people with the condition it, will, it would be, so she is very keen that this should be made available. Um, I know that the committee um, are considering looking um, at um, writing to NHS Tayside and encouraging them to apply to the funds that the Scottish Government suggested. And that was also suggested previously. I had a debate in this a couple of years ago, and that wasn't really suitable. I, I've written again to the Minister, and I wonder if the committee would consider backing this up, about um, the National Services Division and whether they would reconsider funding treatments under this, because I think um, that would be the game changer. We're really close to to there, all the um, scientific work and um, casework surrounding this looks really positive. And yes, it is a new treatment, so you know it will take time to embed all of that. But it is a game changer for people with essential tremor and also other conditions. We're only really finding out where this could affect, but it could it could actually have um, an impact on things like brain cancers as well as Parkinson's and the like. So. I, I'm, I'm happy that the committee take the, the action um, of getting back to NHST side and seeing if any of the government's response is helpful to them. But I would be keen um, that you also go back to government and ask them to kind of push at the National Services Division a wee bit because it would be a shame that people in Scotland lose out um, from a treatment that might be available elsewhere. And that is really um, needed. And if you just indulge me, because Mary wrote to me, obviously she, she was keen that I attend um, the committee and speak to you. Um, and, and I just think this takes in the human aspect of it. She tells me, I, my tremors and the lack of understanding surrounding them has impacted on my entire life. Those of us with essential tremor deserve better, and there is a better option. 
If there's a will and determination to fight essential tre tremor and to understand its causes, it can be overcome for generations that will come after me. It is for those determining the outcome of this consultation to decide whether their will and their determination is sufficient for Scottish doctors and Scots with essential tremor to have the best opportunity to fight this fight. And for me and for my part, a focused ultrasound helps someone avoid what I went through I will fight to my last breath to get it. So uh, she is absolutely passionate about this. This is not something that's going to impact on her at all. But she is really clear that she doesn't want anyone else to go through what she's gone through. And this is the game changer. And, you know, dragging our feet is not really an option. I think we need to embrace it, get it in place and get people treated. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks very much for that. Other comments? Brian? Thank you. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting when you read, read through the notes. If you look at the, the, the Sue Ryder's response, looking to see if the, uh, you know, that we should be approaching this to see if the general standards for neurological care and support, which was published, would provide direction for service uh, providers. And we look at NHT side saying that they recognise that the treatment uh, they would expect a significant demand should um, uh, uh, this treatment be made available. And then we have the government suggesting that, they have, and they're looking for government support. And then the government suggesting that they would that there's a fund there to be to, to, to support this kind of kind of um, treatment development. Seems to me that all the pieces are there. Um, I, I would be right to NHS Tayside, uh, asking them if they have actually applied uh, applied for this uh, the, the, the fund for this for the equipment and the installation, which 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 seems to be readily available. So, or is there for us? I would be, I would, I would certainly ask them to see whether, whether they're going to, or whether they've already, already applied for that fund, because all, all, the, it seems to me everybody's agreeing. Uh, you know, as, as with uh, what, what uh, Rhoda Grant has just said, everybody's agreeing that this has, that this, this is the way forward. Mm -hmm. Just somebody has to actually have the will to make it happen. It's not the case, though, that the the National Special Services Committee are saying that there needs to be a clear evidence base. And that they would support a reapplication if there's more evidence. So, they're, so but they're waiting for more evidence to come. I think I think that that, that was when, it, when I was struck by the Sue, Sue Ryder's response in that there is a, a, a general standards for neurological care and support published already this year. Whether that uh, that provides that that kind of direction mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and information for a service provider. So, you know, it, it, we seem to we seem to be you know it seems to me we're going to get to where we need to get to. Uh, in, in terms of this, it's, why don't we just cut to the chase and, and, yeah. and, and do it? If yeah. we can work on the assumption that people would do that if they could, I suppose it's understanding <laughs> what the block is. It's, so they're saying they need more evidence. Is the evidence being gathered and, and brought forward? I suppose what is reassuring is they say if they, if they get more evidence, then they would consider a reapplication. So I suppose in writing to the Scottish Government, we, w we would want them to unpick that for us. Yes. Mm. We just want them to unpick that for us. What is you know? Is we, they say they can't fund it because there's not it's not been cleared. The committee is saying um, if we get more evidence, we would clear it. Is this what is? If anything is stalling it, um, well, obviously you don't want there will be a reluctance to bring forward a, a, a procedure if it's not going to do what it's supposed to do, and obviously we'll take into account direct experience. Um, so I suppose. That's the question we're asking them, uh, not working assumption that anybody's holding back, but that that you know how do, how can that bit of it be unblocked? Mm -hmm. I, th I think the the NHS. I mean, again, we are not we are not medically trained in any way and can't can't <laughs> offer that opinion. But NHS T side are saying that they expect a significant demand. Mm -hmm. Is the efficacy of this this yeah. uh, grows? So it seems to me that there's there's. You know, we're, we're, there's a direction of travel we're going in here. So should we be asking then the issue about timescales? I mean, of the national, the NSSC and of the Scottish Government, what is it, in what timescale do they expect all of this to kind of be progressed? What is it they're looking for? Because that seems to, you know, if everybody's vehemently agreeing with each other, this is, has benefits. What is, what is the delay if we're working on assumption that then there's nobody willfully delaying it. What is it they require and what kind of timescale are they looking at for that? Would that be worthwhile 
highlighted to the Scottish Government. Gail? Yeah, I mean, I would just like to um, follow up on Rhoda Grant's point about the National Specialist Services Division that, that you're right into. Is that correct? To Jean Freeman to get in touch with them. Yeah. I, we've chased it up, but we haven't had a response yet, so I'm assuming there is something happening, which I, she's not in a position to reply to me yet, so I'm hoping that there is some discussion going on, and it would be helpful if the committee would maybe put their weight behind that as well to see yes. if we can yeah, get absolutely. some change. I mean, I would agree with that, because it does say in our papers that they met on the 4th of December 2018. We're now in January 2020, so it'd be interesting to see how far things have moved on, if they have at all. So I would definitely back Rhoda Grant in that as well. Okay. Brian? I think inviting to, uh, body, I think, uh, writing to Health Improvement Scotland is probably something we should be doing as well. This is quite heavily within their remit as well, because uh, um, they would probably be able to answer the questions just as well as the, the, the Scottish Government. Because the Scottish Government will go to his. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we, we can we can ask the clerks to identify the, the most useful people to go to, but we're agreeing um, that there is an issue here. How does this get unblocked, um, and with what time scales would they expect the NSSC to be able to make a, a decision, and whether you because know, the Scottish government can be passive in it and say, well, when we hear some more, we might think about it then, but whether there's a a push to get that kind of um, information would be useful. Is that agreed? agreed. Okay, in that yep. case, and to thank Rhoda Grant for her attendance. If we can move on then to the next continued petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1724 on Equal Rights for Commercial Attorneys and Party Litigants in the Legal System, lodged by Bill Alexander. At last consideration of this petition in September, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government and other relevant stakeholders asking for views and the written views already received from the Lord President and the Petitioner. Responses have now been received from the Law Society of Scotland, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, the Competition and Markets Authority, the Scottish Government and the Petitioner. Uh, Mary Fee, MSP, um, has contacted us to indicate that she's been unable to attend the consideration of this petition today and has given her apologies, but she has provided a written statement as follows. She says, I have spoken at length to the petitioner and I'm fully supportive of the petition for the following reasons. Commercial attorneys are not treated in the same way as other members of the legal profession. They were invited to put a submission to the recent Robertson review, but were not included as part of the review body. Commercial attorneys do not have equality of aims with solicitors. There is an ongoing issue of how commercial attorneys can meet the test set out by the Lord President to wear gowns in the courtroom. Um, and she believes there is merit in continuing this petition and fully examining this issue. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. <coughs> David. Thank you, Convener. I don't think the public petitions could take this any further because the Scottish Government has made it quite clear it doesn't support the action of the petitioner. So I think we should close it. Okay. Other views? Brian? Yeah, I think it's it's one of those ones where, if it hadn't been for the fact that the the, the Scottish government are adamant that they're not going to not going to move on this and, and they don't support this, we probably uh, would have, have done what Mary Fee has asked us to do. And, and because it does it, it does look that this petition does have merit to at least do a, a little bit more digging. But the reality is that. Uh, Nothing's going to happen in this because, as I said, the Scottish Government, in the Scottish Government's response, they have no intention um, of, of, of moving their position. So the reality is we can't do anything with this, I don't think. So I think reluctantly, uh, I could say I agree with David. I wonder if what we could do is encourage the petition to engage in the Scottish Government's future consultation plan on the development of a new statutory framework for a modern, forward-looking legal service regulatory system in Scotland in response to the findings of the Robertson Review so that actively engaging um, directly with the Scottish Government um, you know, would allow the petitioner to try and influence what has is, is been decided. I think, there are, I think we have provided a platform for this argument. We have considered it on a number of occasions, so it's not something that's been dismissed. Um, the arguments have been presented and the paperwork is there. Um, but I, I, my sense is that there's really, in an argument which is 
you know, two particular views of what, what's happened, it's difficult to see what we could, could do further. If that's agreed. So I think we are agreeing to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of standing orders, um, particularly on the basis that the Scottish Government has confirmed it does not support the action called for in the petition, but also recognising there's an opportunity for the petitioner to engage in future um, consultation with the Scottish Government in response to the findings of the Robertson's review. Is that agreed? Yes. Okay. In that case, um, we would want to thank the petitioner again for um, engaging in the process and, of course, in a year's time, if they continue to be unsatisfied, they may wish to consider presenting a further petition to the committee. We now move on to petition, uh, the eighth continued petition for consideration today, which is petition 1725 on suicide awareness and support for young people lodged by Anne-Marie Cocosa. At our last consideration of this petition in September, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government as well as explore the issues raised in the petition through our current inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland. A written submission has now been received from the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and the petitioner and are included in our papers. Our paper also highlights the ways in which we have considered the issues raised in this petition through our inquiry work. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. We need to sort of explore a bit further on this and, and, and talk with the fam it says families and friends are affected by murder and su suicide, the FAMS organisation, to inform what, you know, gather more information uh, to really understand this really quite distressing mm -hmm. situation. And, and I think we feel we need to get more of a handle on this yeah. before we can come to any conclusion. Brian? I think, I think it, 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 uh, this petition plays into, um, sort of plugs into quite a lot of the other petitions around mental health. Uh, that we have uh, in the Petitions Committee and, and the investigation that we're, we're currently doing. And I, I agree with my colleague um, here that uh, I, I'd actually quite like to hear from uh, FAMS, because I think, I, I mean, it does play into a much wider, mm -hmm. uh, a much wider work that we're currently doing. Mm -hmm. I think we were very clear that the issues that they raised and were, and I thought, very interesting, the kind of various areas that they thought could usefully develop did could form part of our inquiry um, and that we took the matters they raised very seriously and, they, and, and also the, the, they're very much located in practical ways in which they can support people. I mean, I would be very interested in meeting with them and I know they've offered a meeting where they're operating and I think that would be particularly interesting because I was struck by the particular arguments they made around addressing the cause as well as dealing with the consequence of, of mental health distress. Um, and, you know, across parties, probably there's been a commitment to more school counsellors, mm -hmm. but actually they they make quite a compelling argument that there's something different needs to be needs that this isn't going to be an easy fix around this. So I would be really keen um, to have the opportunity to engage with them, probably in a setting where they're working um, in their own location, and we could see and hear from them directly and, and do that not as part of a formal. Um, hearing but as part of, of this inquiry and, and ensure that at least a number of the members here would be able to attend that. And I know that that's something that they have been keen, that the issues that they directly feel they have um, experience on are, are, are fed back into our inquiry. And I think we'd be very keen to, um, to, to make sure that that happened um, if people were uh, agreed with taking it forward in that way. Great. I think there is a recognition as, we, as, as Brian says, around all of the issues around mental health that have been brought before us, just how serious this issue is, and particularly for young people, ensuring that the right interventions are, are available at the point where young people need them, um, and that that can then be part of the further report on, on, on our findings around our inquiry, yeah. if that's agreed. agreed. Okay, we look forward um, to that work being progressed. If we can then move on to the ninth and final continued petition for consideration day, which is petition 1731 on permit audio recording of local government public meetings lodged by Tom Taylor, which calls the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to amend the Local Government Scotland Act 1973 to permit audio recording of all public council meetings by members of the public. This is a continued petition, last considered by the committee on 19 September 2019. At this meeting, the committee agreed to write to the Scottish Government, COSLA, and all local authorities to seek their views on the action called for in the petition. 
Responses have been received from the Scottish Government, COSLA, and 16 of the 32 local authorities. The clerk's note summarises all the responses. And I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there have been a number of local authorities that have come back to us with concerns about how these recordings would be used, if they could be um, tampered with in any way to put forward a particular point of view, and if they could or would record um, private or sensitive information. But I think, as the um, Scottish Government have stated, this doesn't happen elsewhere where public recording is um, permitted. And also, they're only talking about public meetings, mm -hmm. so therefore there shouldn't be any private or sensitive information discussed in a public meeting. Um, the Scottish Government has said that it has no objection in principle, so I think that our next step would be to write to the Scottish Government to find out if they plan to implement it and how it would work. Mm -hmm. Brian? I, th I think, yeah. I mean, we're, we're in a public meeting right now. It's being recorded. Um, and if there's sensitive... Good to <laughs> If there's sensitive information, then we go into private session. And it's not recorded. So um, I, 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 I agree. I think the Scottish Government have agreed in principle to, to the petition uh, petitioner's request. So it'll be quite interesting to write to the Scottish Government to see where, how they're going to support the petition. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think in principle, it, it's, it's reasonable. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that... that struck me was obviously the variety of responses from different local authorities mm -hmm. and I wonder if at least part of it is an issue about funding and in circumstances where there, there is little or no there, there's pre to put it as kind as huge pressures and budgets have local authorities made the decision well, this is not a priority and then from that extrapolate logically they say well we, there are lots of reasons why we can't do it and if that's the case, I suppose part of asking the Scottish Government, if they want this to happen, this is funded in here. So this is funded in here, our, our recording. Is there something about ensuring if the local authorities are not doing that, there's some kind of fund or recognition of the extra um, cost it might, it might entail? Dale? So, well, just as a, a, a counter to that, I think the local authorities that don't webcast and archive meetings um, because of funding issues should really be welcoming the fact that members of the public want to come in and record these meetings so that there will be a recording of them somewhere. So, you know, I think that, um, yeah, I think that there's kind of reasons to... And you can see in, you know, in sort of more remote areas the actual benefit of recording and access when it's not physically possible for people to go along um, and attend meetings such that being able to be engaged with the, the process, there's a kind of a practical democratic element to it as well. I think, uh, I say, I mean, uh, having been involved this with our Gambute Council as a councillor, this, this subject came up some years ago, um, and one we, we issue was one was cost, uh, and the other was the question of the content of the meetings, but as far in general terms, the public meetings, i.e. the full council meetings were fine, but when it had to uh, go into private session, that was another matter. Um, and that obviously applied to things like regulatory meetings, such as a licensing board and things like that, because you're discussing, for example, taxi driver licenses and things like that and, and, and character references. Um, the, the worry we had as a, as the council was, was, was the question of, um, you know, having a, a true recording you know, and not saying you know, and, and preventing tampering. That was one of the issues um, with that. Um, and so, whilst the council, uh, uh, in general terms, felt comfortable that it could be done for public public meetings, um, and it would be done by the council, uh, there then became the financial constraint on it, and, and having. Mm -hmm. And particularly with the island communities, of course, yes, there was a benefit of making sure there was an engagement with, with, with that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think the point <coughs> is made, which is perhaps I've slightly misrepresented, that the petition specifically asks that people should be able to record. And that there are reservations with that because it may be falsely edited mm, or whatever. Mm, mm. If that's a reservation... Is there a way in which there could be a fund that you could access, at least the well, local authorities it was, providing it? Was, yeah. it? Um, so it may be that, that that, in a sense, is the tension between the two. Um, I, I certainly think in interest of transparency, we are minded to think this is a good idea. Um, and so I suppose it's a question, as we've agreed, that we would be writing to Scottish Government um, in the light of the support for the petition 
to ask how they would plan to take that forward and put in the safeguards that perhaps local authorities are concerned about. Mm -hmm. Is that agreed? Yeah. Brian? We should we should note when I said that this is a, this, this, uh, we're in a public session just now that's being recorded. It's being officially recorded, and the public are not allowed to record this. And mm -hmm. I think yeah. you know that, that that's probably the standard that we yeah. want to yeah. uh, promote. Yes. So the the kind of fallback positions presented by the petition is there a way in dealing with the concerns around that by having a a, a formal process, yeah. and we yeah. could flag that up to them. Okay, agreed. if that's agreed. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So we're agreeing tonight to Scotch government um, in those terms. And with that, uh, can I thank everybody for their attendance and I'll close the meeting. Thank you.